welcome to Garden Success with Skip Richter, the show designed to help you have a bountiful garden and a beautiful landscape. Call in now with your lawn and garden questions at 979-845-5689 or email your questions to gardensuccess at tamu.edu. And now, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist Skip Richter. Well, hello, and welcome to Garden Success. We are so glad you're listening today. Boy, there's a lot to talk about. First of all, it's raining, and it's a little bit milder in the temperatures. So after this summer, I'm pretty sure, I'm surprised people aren't out dancing in the front yard in the rain, because (laughs) that's about how good and exciting it is to actually be getting rain. That is really, really helpful. Hey, if you would like to call our show today, we are a call-in, by the way. The phone number is 979-845-5689, 845-5689, or by email at gardensuccess at tamu.edu, gardensuccess at tamu.edu. Give us a call. Let's talk about the stuff that you are interested in. And apparently trees, trees, and more trees is the stuff you guys are interested in based on looking at the email and then, of course, the kinds of calls and questions we get at the Texas AgriLife Extension Service. Uh, It is a uh, time that a lot of people are concerned about what's going on with my trees. My trees are dying. Other trees are dying. What can I do about it? Uh, It's just a... It's... it's, uh, a big concern that people have. So let's let's go through a few of the emails today. Uh, we will begin to go that direction. I have some other comments as well, but the uh, show is best when we get your calls. So I uh, hope that you will give us a call at 845-5689 if you have any kind of question. I guarantee you that somebody else does as well. That is for sure. Well, Syed had emailed about a holly. And uh, this is just kind of describe the picture to you. It's a holly plant uh, in a nice, uh, looks like a good bed with good soil, uh, and it's just dying back. There's huge sections of brown in it, and uh, it kind of looks like it's on its way out. You know, the, in, in answering these questions, one of the things that is often pointed out is the tree is being watered, oh, let's say 30 minutes, three times a week, or, you know, whatever schedule it is and the question is is that enough is that not enough uh, what should i do how why is it dying if i'm watering like this and a lot of questions this week are related to that kind of thing so first i want to answer uh, something about the watering when it comes to hollies the first 3 years really but especially the first year or two it's important to keep the roots evenly moist all the time I don't know how long this particular plant has been in the ground uh, that um, uh, Syed has sent in, uh, but if, you're, if your plant is, let's say, under three years in the ground, uh, it is still establishing a good root system, especially the first and second year. And in the process of that, we have to keep the soil moist because hollies are not tolerant of completely drying out when they have a very limited root system. As they get better established, they're a little more resilient. We don't have to worry about them so much because they have roots far and wide in all directions. And so they're able to to handle that. When it uh, it has a confined root system, I mean, picture this. You pull it out of a cylinder pot and you put it in the ground and the entire root system of that whole plant, which had it grown in the ground, would have been stretching many feet in all directions, is now in this, depends on the pot size, but let's say it's a, 5-gallon, 10-gallon, 15-gallon pot. The whole root system is right there. And so it's fast that that plant would pump all the water dry that the roots have access to. Now, if the soil is moist around it, yes, you're getting a little gradual slow, you know, wicking in toward the roots from there, but not a lot. And so uh, it doesn't take but a few, you know, a couple of two or three days, and a plant can get in really bad trouble. And so if you're ever planting hollies especially, but it's true of all plants, just remember that when that plant goes in the ground, that that root system is extremely confined. And you have to treat the plant, especially during that first summer uh, after planting, as if it was still in a pot. Imagine if you had buried the pot with the plant and not taking it out of the pot. Then it would be clear, yeah, all the roots are right there. They can't get out of there. 
And so you would focus your watering there because that's what the nursery did when they were taking care of it day after day or week after week or the grower was growing it. It was getting watered one or two times a day and uh, getting everything it needed to keep it going and to enable growth of a big plant with essentially no root spread at all. So when, it, when you put it in the ground, it takes time. Now, if it went in the ground and had a circling root going around and around the pot, uh, those don't establish as quickly or as well as one where you cut roots in several places to cause them to branch and reach out quickly and establish. And they do that quickly. Within three weeks of cutting a root, you can dig down and, and see that cut, and it's got fresh new white roots coming out from it. So those are all some general principles about holly and about any kind of plant that you would put in. The other thing is, is discussing the how many times you water a week, how long do you water a week, that is very difficult to assess, and uh, it could be clay soil, it could be uh, sandy soil. Sand needs watering much more often than clay. Uh, clay holds water a long time. It And by the way, in a clay soil, when you drop a pot in and you've created this slick-sided clay hole that it drops in, uh, roots are not venturing out as well, and when you water, water can literally fill up. It's like an underground bathtub. You know, dig a hole in a clay soil. Farmers call that a farm pond. <laughs> they actually line the pond with bentonite, which is a clay, so that it holds water. So that planting hole could essentially be that underground bathtub that when you overwater, now the roots are submerged, and with the stresses and strains and demands of summer, they can't keep up. So actually, overwatering or underwatering, both are really deadly for, for a plant, especially in the first years when before it gets well established. So uh, that that's one thing to keep in mind. The other thing I was going back to, the other thing is the uh, how much do I water and how often. So in a, in a sand, the water doesn't stick around. It doesn't um, cling to the particles uh, as well as in a clay where you have very fine particles, small spaces, lots of surface area, and you can hold a lot of water in a clay. In a sand, you can't. So you water a sand more often. Uh, as far as the volume, you want to be able to soak the root system to a depth of about, I would say, 8 inches, maybe 10, uh, on, a, on a young tree. And uh, that takes a good soaking of water. Now, depending on the sprinkler system you have, the distribution is anything blocking sprinklers from reaching all areas of the root zone, uh, and on and on. It may take a long time to apply the right amount of water, or it may take a very short time to apply the right amount of water. And so how many times a week? Well, if, if it's a new plant in its first summer, I would say three times a week. Maybe Let's just say it this way, every other day, uh, giving it a good soaking uh, to wet that root zone. But uh, if it is well established, then you're not going to water three times a week. Even once a week would be enough for a plant that's got some good roots in the ground and you're just trying to help it along. For established trees that are big, every 10 to 14 days, let's say 10 days to two weeks, when we are in the middle of a brutal, extended, excessively hot, and very dry spell, then we're watering about every 10 days to two weeks to keep a tree going. Uh, and that isn't you know, trees live without us with no water at all, right? Go out and drive in the countryside. But we're trying to keep it not just alive, but healthy and in a good form. And those rescue waterings are what we do for a well-established tree that's a little further along in its life. So the, the amount of time you water and, and uh, how often you water, it's kind of hard. It's hard to say in general beyond what I just said. W what I would do is dig down. Uh, when you do a good watering, uh, whatever you're considering a good watering, then wait a little bit, maybe 45 minutes or so, let it soak as it's going to soak, and then just dig down somewhere around the tree uh, where you can get a, a, a spade in the ground or a hand spade, rather, uh, and dig down and see how, how deep is it wet. And that will tell you how long you need to water to wet to that depth. So those are some tips. It, it varies a lot. You know, I mentioned hollies being a little extra particular about that than some plants. And then, you know, the weather. Now that it started raining again and the temperature is breaking, I'm not worried about our trees at all. Now, if it's a brand new tree or in its first year, yeah, let's keep taking care of it. But in general, those trees are fine. They have an extensive root system, and they're, they're okay now. We've gotten enough water for them. They're okay. We should not have to worry about them again until next June.
or July even. It depends on what kind of weather we have next year. So those are some thoughts. Let me expand that question though from Syed out to to the the lawns. Uh, watering lawns is 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 a difficult one as well to describe in terms of how much, how often. Uh, we generally say when you are in dry conditions, you should apply one inch of water per week to your lawn. But sandy soil versus clay soil, that's going to affect that. Uh, is it in the shade or the sun? That hugely affects it. I've seen lawns that were literally dying in the sun while those in the shade receiving the same water on the same zone were just fine. They were doing very good. And so that makes a big difference. But the way that I suggest people uh, check uh, if you're watering your lawns enough, and again, we're entering fall, we're not so worried about our lawn watering, uh, but in the summer is number one, put out straight-sided cans like tuna fish, cat food, you know, pinto bean can that you've emptied, something with straight sides, put them all around in the yard and turn on the water. How long does it take to catch at least a half inch of water? Uh, and it's going to run off probably before you apply a full inch. So you may have to water and then let it soak. That's one way. You know, once you test that one time, you know what your system can put out and you water your, you set the length of your watering accordingly. The other way that works really well, especially in a clay soil, is to get a long handle screwdriver. And as that soil surface begins to dry out and then you water it, uh, you can shove that screwdriver straight in the ground with very little uh, effort at all. But when you hit dry down below, let's say your water was only soaking four inches deep in this particular watering cycle you have, you, it would go four inches down and then it'd be like you hit a rock. I mean, <laughs> that, that dry soil, it is not going to go through it uh, without you jumping up and down on the screwdriver. And so that would tell you I've only wet my soil four inches deep and we'd like to wet it about six inches deep for our turf. And so you could water a little bit longer. And that would be a way also you could come back later and, and just check on how that's doing. So those are a couple of ideas. Uh, these are questions that uh, good black and white answer, simple ABC, is, is kind of hard to come by. You just have to think about these principles. And I just kind of spewed a few of them out there for you to, to think about. Uh, hopefully that will be helpful. Uh, we had a, by the way, our phone number is 845 Five six eight nine eight four five fifty six eighty nine, or by email, garden success at tamu dot edu. Garden success at tamu dot edu. Had a question come in from Sue about lawns as well, and uh, they just put in some St. Augustine sod in their backyard, and they want to know what is the recommended water cycle to establish its rooting success. Now this is a different kind of lawn watering question. When you buy sod, it has a little thin, what, half inch or so of, of soil, typically clay soil, because it's grown on the Gulf Coast in the areas that are very heavy in clay. And that is essentially no root system at all. I mean, it, it just isn't uh, for a plant. So you lay the sod, you get good contact between the soil below and the sod above. I generally will water the soil before I lay the sod not a whole lot, but a little bit, get some water soaked in there. So when you lay the sod on it, it's not laying on top of dry soil. Uh, and then you're watering probably, if it were summer, twice a day, a little in the morning, a little in the afternoon. Uh, this time of year, I would say once a day is probably enough, but you don't need to add a lot because remember, it's got half inch long root system. So <laughs> you, you just water enough to keep that sod and the soil with it moist as well as a little bit uh, in the in the soil below that uh, and you're doing it once a day for about a week and then you switch to twice a day uh, for about a week and then it's pretty well established after two weeks if it's had good care it's got some roots down and you can start to back off toward a normal watering cycle uh, but Again, the temperature outside makes all the difference in the world. Uh, if it's 95 degrees, 
what I just said definitely applies. If it drops down in the upper 70s, no, you're not going to have to water that much because it's not going to dry out that fast. Just remember, you're getting very little roots when you get the sod, and th that plant then can put roots down once it's established, as long as there's good uh, sod to soil contact underneath. There's not big air space underneath there. So that's kind of the guide that I would use, uh, uh, Sue. And uh, hopefully that'll that'll help get you off to a good start. We, uh, those who lost lawns in the summer, we've got this little window in um, October where we can plant a lawn, we can sod a lawn, and have enough weeks to get it at least pegged down pretty good before going into winter. Once we get into November, December, the roots just aren't growing uh, hardly at all. And getting sod to do something other than just lay there on the surface until spring, uh, you know, it's just not really not really a good time to, to put in new sod when it's cooler like that. But uh, early October, mid-October, probably still okay uh, getting that done. We're going to go to the phones now and talk to Gary. Hello, Gary. Hey, Skip. Hey. Uh, I'm, down in the, uh, I'm down in the Houston area. we got really heavy clay soils, and I'm putting in some landscaping beds, and I want to invest in... Uh, Gosh, what's what's it called? Uh, expanded shale. Yes. Seeing an expanded shale mm -hmm. as an amendment. So I already did it on one of my beds. I was following uh, some of the, I think it was like earth kind soil like recommendations for that. And right. I was wondering what am I looking for in terms of like the final mix because I tilled it a bunch, and but I'm still seeing I don't know how much more I can work it. Uh, I'm still seeing clumps of like clay, clay with a bunch yeah. of. Yeah. you know of the shale mixed in what am i kind of looking for there well uh, we generally recommend about three inches of expanded shale if you have a very heavy clay and you're trying to make a, a bed with some depth to it uh and and the reason is you know to just have expanded shale is a little porous rock is what it amounts to and so if you just have a particle here and a particle there, well, you just got all clay in between them, and it's not doing as much good. It's doing a little good, but not as much, as if you get that volume up a little bit higher. And so about three inches, and I know that's a lot of expanded shale, but that would be something to aim for. You could also, uh, Gary, just put in a lot of good quality composted organic matter, and you guys are fortunate down in that area to have a number of good suppliers. And uh, just uh, mix that in as deeply as you can. You know, first mix in the expanded shale, then mix in some compost. And uh, I think in doing so, you're going to create the best best environment you can. Okay, yeah. I, I did about three inches of expanded shale on this first bed that I was testing it out on. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I'm seeing is like maybe like one to three inch clumps of clay. Yeah. With that shale, though, I mean, there's plenty of shale in there. I guess I just kind of wanted to make sure that I didn't have to get it like a perfect, like, homogenous mixture. No. That's gonna kinda... Yeah, no, you're not going to accomplish that uh, anyway. And so, okay. and be careful working that clay when the soil is wet. Uh, it really destroys structure of soil to work it when it's wet. I mean, imagine, uh, you know, a microscope and you get in there and look real closely at your soil. Uh, a, a clay that's got organic matter and expanded shale and whatnot in it that, that the particles are clumping together is almost like popcorn under a microscope, you know, that's already been popped. Uh, and so if imagine if that was wet and you were mashing around on it, all that airspace you're just sort of crushing out. Of the, uh -oh. of the mix. So we like it to be moist. If you if the clay is hard, it's like Rhoda telling a sidewalk, <laughs> you're not going to get in there. Yeah. But yeah. if it's but if it's very wet, you're going to work against yourself and and destroying some of the structure that it it may already have. So that that would be my only recommendation, uh just to work it when it's moist, not wet. Uh, are you getting a lot of rain today down there? Yes, yeah, yeah. it's it's so I don't think I'm going to be doing anything for the next yeah. Days. No, well, that's uh, true. That that's true. Uh, once we and once we cool off and the drying out is much much slower, uh, it it's hard to find a good time to work work the soil. Okay. Cool. Yeah, I appreciate that. And uh, yeah, I, I mix it all in. I mean, I I can tell it's raised up, you know, six or so inches more than it was before. So it sounds like I good. kind of do everything right. So yeah, yeah, you are. And the, you know, the only other thing would be to add. A compost or uh, down in that area that several places sell what they call rose soil and forget the word rose in it it's just a good bed soil 
uh, and uh, you can put that down and mix it in a little bit too, raise it up a little bit more. Plus, the organic matter does things the shell cannot. You know, it's it's uh, and mm -hmm. as far as the microbial activity going on in there, uh, releasing the nutrients as it decomposes, um, it, it's just it's just good. They, they they work well together, expanded shale and organic matter. I guess, I guess I have a quick follow up question. So I got all this information from there's a YouTube video. I I cannot remember his name now, but there was a uh, an AgriLife uh, Extension uh, specialist that was presenting on building an earth kind soil uh -huh. and uh you know he's saying once you put in this first amendment then uh you can just mulch yes. at uh at a yearly interval or more than yearly but uh yes. you wouldn't have to add in any kind of extra compost i mean yeah does that sound yeah like that, i'm like i'm on the right track there he, yes uh it probably was dr george was it somebody sitting like inside with a a yes. display book. Yeah, that was Dr. George, and he he has been a leader in uh, Earthkind roses and a lot of the Earthkind work that A and M has done. And what they found when they're planting these roses out in a field with essentially <laughs> very little benefits, they they initially amended the soil with the shale and perhaps some organic matter, but then they throw just wood chips on top and let them decompose over time. And think about the forest floor. There's branches falling, there's leaves falling every year, and one, you know, the next year's fall on last year's, and, and you just get this really nice, soft, spongy, decaying organic matter system, and the roots really thrive in that, and it works really well. But you have to keep it well mulched, you know, so you all, don't ever pull out the old mulch, just add fresh mulch on top, because the old mulch is right when things are starting to get good. Mm hmm. Great. Well, yeah, I'm looking forward to building the soil up that way and uh, appreciate the information. All right, sir. Thank you for the call. Appreciate that, Gary. Our phone number is 979-845-5689, 979-845-5689, or by email at gardensuccess at T-A-M-U dot E-D-U. Talk about a couple of activities going on around and about. Uh, first of all, on uh, today, October 5th, Thursday, uh, this evening, uh, starting at 6.30 with a meet and greet and then the program, excuse me, 6 o'clock with a meet and greet and the program at 6.30, the Post Oak Chapter, our local chapter of the Native Plant Society of Texas, is having their meeting out at the Gary Halter Nature Center, which is on Lick Creek Park. If you're new to this area, you take Rock Prairie Road, which is in the southern part of College Station, uh, out to the east, you know, cross over Highway 6 and just keep going. You'll get to Lick Creek Park. And this program, uh, it, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, there's a, there is a, um, a speaker from the Department of Range, Wildlife, and Fisheries Management. Uh, that His name is uh, Ryder Combs, and he is going to be talking about ecology and natural resource teaching area, past, present, and the plants. The, de the department uh, has a, a piece of land where they have been managing it uh, in its wild state and trying different things to see what are the results of that. You know, so you go out and buy a piece of land and it's not looking real good. How do you bring back grasses and which ones do you use and what practices do you use and stuff? And this will be a very interesting talk, ecology and natural resource teaching area, past, present, and plants, post oak chapter of the Native Plant Society of America uh, tonight. Uh, meet and greet at 6, presentation at 6.30 at Lick Creek Park. Hope you can make that. I think you will definitely enjoy that one. Uh, also going on, our Brazos County Master Gardeners are having at the uh, the uh, Clara B. Mounts Library. In 20, it's on 26th Street in Bryan. They're having a Learning at the Library program. They do this all the time, uh, but this upcoming one is October 21st. It's a Saturday at 10 a.m., and it's free of charge, by the way, as is the the um, Native Plant Society program I just mentioned. Uh, and this one is going to be seasonal plants after the season, and the people can come there and learn about it. Uh, they're going to talk about poinsettias and Christmas cactus and mums and so on. Uh, one of our master gardeners, Maureen Reap, will talk about the selection, care, and afterlife. I like that. 
Afterlife of Seasonal Plants. It's open, of course, to the public at no charge. So what do you do with that Christmas cactus after you finished? It's bloomed and, you know, what, what, where do you go from here? Well, come to this program, Saturday, October 21st, 10 a.m. You can learn about it. On October 24th, the Master Gardeners of Brazos County are, at the, are having a program at the AgriLife Extension Office. That's on County Park Court in Bryan. It's right next to the uh, Brazos County Tax Office. It's called Cedar Fever, Junipers in Central Texas. And this will be Tuesday, October 24th at 7 p.m. And Morgan Abbott, who is our regional woodland ecologist with Texas A&M Forest Service here in College Station area, is exploring the relationship between cedars humans and where they intersect here in Central Texas, looking at the ecological roles, the historical practices, and so on. It's an hour-long presentation looking at cedar fever and how it affects the residents of Central Texas. That'll be a really good one. I don't know if, uh, if what your allergies are, but if you live in, <laughs> in let's say, over in the Austin area, uh, there is this horrible thing that happens when the cedars d drop their pollen, and for a lot of people, it's a very miserable season, kind of like ragweed. Uh, for some folks. But a lot has been done looking at the history of cedar, how they moved. Uh, how, you know, it used to be that cedar was not a big problem because uh, occasional wildfires going through the plains of central Texas would, would take them out. Uh, and then we came in, started fencing and taking care of the land in different ways and so on. Uh, and it's become a quite a, quite a pervasive plant all over the area. Uh, in central Texas. That's the ash juniper that they have over here, over there. Uh, and over here, uh, we look more at the eastern red cedar, although the two are very similar and can, uh, I think, uh, I believe they can even uh, cross uh, in the area. All right, well, that's a lot going on uh, here in the area. We've got some other things that I'll talk about. Our phone number, by the way, 845-5689. Uh, the Brazos County Rose Society is going to meet at noon on Tuesday, October 10th, next Tuesday. Uh, James Knipe, one of our uh, master gardeners, will discuss rose pruning and talk about proper pruning techniques. If you want more details, write down this number. It's the 979 area code 680-8046. 680-8046. For those of you who love birds or are interested in birds, birds on October 11th, Wednesday next week, the Rio Brazos Audubon Society is meeting at the Museum of Natural History, which is on Briarcrest Drive on the east side of Highway 6 in Bryan. Uh, it will be from 6.30 to 8 p.m. And uh, Smiley Flores will be talking about birding in Costa Rica. If you want more information, riobrazosaudubon.org. RioBrazosAudubon.org. My goodness, I don't remember when we've had this many activities going on. I think I've spent the whole show reading <laughs> activities. Either that or somebody call at 845-5689. Uh, I love talking about these activities, though, because there's so much good going on. To If you have one drop of gardening blood or birding blood or anything like that, uh, we got a lot of things for you. Next Friday, October the 13th, the A&M Garden Club is meeting at Peace Lutheran Church Fellowship Hall. They are at Rio Grande Boulevard, um, uh, uh, 2101 Rio Grande Boulevard, Peace Lutheran Church, at 9.30 in the morning. Now, Mike and Stephanie Howlett with a Pet Venus Flytrap will present Feeding the Little Beast, Carnivorous Plants. That's... That's going to be, that's something I think kids will be interested in. Uh, but go to amgardenclub.com. No and, just amgardenclub.com, and you can find out more information on this meeting of the A&M Garden Club. Of course, the public's welcome, and there's not a charge. On Tuesday, October 17th, let's just go ahead and stretch it out another week so you can get these things on your calendar. Uh, the Texas A&M Women's Garden Interest Group, Women's Club Garden Interest Group. They call that the gig good thing for Aggies, right? Garden Interest Group. 9.30 a.m. at the George Bush Presidential Library Education Room out at the Presidential Library on George Bush Drive. Now, the program is going to be Birds of the Brazos Valley, and David Scott, uh, one of our Rio Brazos Audubon Society members, he's also a Texas A&M professor emeritus in the Department of Recreation, Park, and Tourism Science. He's going to share his knowledge and experience 
of identifying and attracting resident and migratory birds to the garden. He has listed 710 birds and identified 250 of these by song. And we had him on a long, long time ago where he was playing bird songs and kind of describing uh, what they sound like uh, and which bird that is. If you want more information, just send an email to T-A-M-U-G-I-G, tamugig, at gmail.com. You can find out more about that. All right. Well, that was a lot of information there. I hope you uh, got a few of those down, and I'll check a few of those out. They're, those are kind of cool. Lots of things going on. And, of course, always we've got our farmer's markets going on around here. There is the uh, South Brazos County Farmer's Market, Tuesdays, noon to 5, at the corner of University and Glen Haven. So let's say you're heading out University toward the bypass. The last street to the right, turn right there, and it'll get you right to it. It's just not oh, hardly a block or two in. Uh, local produce, range free or free range eggs, herbs, jams, jellies, honey, olive oil, all that kind of stuff. And that is the South Brazos County Farmers Market. Now, they also meet on Fridays. That was Tuesday from noon to 5. On Fridays from noon to 5, same group, same place. So you got two opportunities there to go in. There is the new, uh, new College Station Farmer's Market, Saturdays from 8 a.m. to noon at the Post Oak Mall parking lot on Harvey Road. This is a new member-driven farmer's market featuring all the local stuff you would expect from a farmer's market and then some. If you want more information, uh, you can give a call to David Wolf at, it's 979, the local area code, 530-3768. And finally, Last but not least, the Brazos Valley Farmer's Market, downtown Bryan at Main and 21st Street. Every Saturday from 8 a.m. to noon. Lots of stuff going on there that you would expect from a farmer's market and then even more. Now, you can go details the, to the website, brazosvalleyfarmersmarket.com. That's pretty easy, brazosvalleyfarmersmarket.com. Uh, I did I did jump over, I was going through these by date, and I did jump over one, and that is uh, the uh, Ringer Library is having a gardening series, and this Thursday today, 6 to 7 p.m., today from 6 to 7 p.m. Uh, at the Larry Ringer Library on Harvey Mitchell Parkway, uh, there is a program on bugs in the garden. Not all bugs are bad for your garden, and Kat Greer with the gardens at Texas A&M is going to talk about beneficial bugs in your backyard garden, how you can encourage them to stick around through the winter. It'll include, this workshop will include building a bug hotel. Yes, you heard that right. A bug hotel that you get to take home with you. <laughs> the registration is free. Oh my gosh, that's that's amazing. Uh, you can find out more if you go to gardens or uh, if you uh, if you email gardens at ag.tamu.edu gardens at ag.tamu.edu T-A-M-U dot E-D-U or just go to the Ringer Library Activities calendar and you can find out more about that. Well, let's see. There is, I guess, one other I need to mention uh, because it's next Thursday. So I'll give you a little head start on it. Uh, Thursday through Monday, October 12th through 16th, the International Oak Society is organizing the Oak Open Days in Texas. And three gardens around Texas will, fix, will feature significant oak collections, and they'll be participating. The Houston Botanic Garden, which is in South Houston, down Hobby Airport Way. The Lady Bird Johnson Waffle Center in Austin, and the John Ferry Garden in Hempstead. Uh, there'll be an oak-focused tour of the Southwest Hill Country on Monday, October 16th. For more information about all of this, uh, you can you have to be, first of all, to to be participate in one or more of the visits in the tour, you have to be a member of the International Oak Society. And you can get that at internationaloaksociety.org. All right, we're going to stop all of the events going on there. I think that's a, a good, good sprinkling. Uh, you're listening to Garden Success, and this is a call-in show. Our phone number is 845 845- Five six eight nine. I, I know what's happening. Uh, everybody is out running around in the sprinklers, uh, just rolling around in the puddles and, and have, <laughs> having a celebration of rain returning. So go back inside. <laughs> Let's talk. Oh, gosh. Uh, some more emails. Let's keep going. Uh, Tim and Tessie planted a burr oak last November, and it looked really good, and they watered it through the summer, and now it's losing some of its older leaves, and that is all okay. 
Tim and Tessie. Uh, it is not unusual, uh, folks, to, to have older leaves on plants start to fall off at all kinds of times of the year. Yes, it's been a stressful summer, but I wouldn't worry about it that those trees still have really good foliage on them and the amount of leaves they're losing is so minimal that it is absolutely nothing to worry about. Obviously, you've taken good care of it through this brutal summer, so congratulations for that. I do notice one thing on the oak uh, photo that you sent that I'd like to make a comment about. When you plant a new oak tree, it has a very smooth, thin bark. And as it starts to get a little older, it starts to develop that rough bark that we would expect from an oak tree. But early on, that bark is thin, and it is subject to something we call southwest injury. Now, what happens is that oak goes dormant, and it's okay. It's doing good, can take cold. But on a warmer-than-normal day especially, but with that sun traveling low in the sky, the hottest time of any day is going to be around 4 o'clock, 3 or 4 o'clock, somewhere in there, uh, because that, you know, that's... The day's heated up as much as it can, and it's about to start, you know, sun going down, cooling off. At that point in the day, the sun is shining on the southwest side of the trunk. And those tissues, with the warmth of that sun baking in on them, uh, even on a cold day, can start to warm up. And you may get a little bit of sap flow going there, and they sort of come out of dormancy and they become susceptible to cold. So that night when we get that blue norther in and the temperature drops down to 15 the next that next morning, those tissues aren't ready for it and you lose tissue there. It dies, it freezes. And you notice it the next season when you start to see cracks appearing and bark peeling back and things like that. That is best prevented by just using a paper tree wrap around the trunk. Just something to block the sun from shining on the trunk tissues. You don't need to do that with a trunk that's the size of a soft drink can or something. It's the young small trees, the ones with an inch or maybe up to a couple of inches uh, trunk before they've really begun developing that. Those are the ones you want to wrap and protect on the southwest side. So if you've planted new trees recently, watch out for that because we've got quite a few trees I see around town that have taken that kind of a hit uh, because of that unique situation where the sun in the southwestern sky uh, coaxes that part of the tree out of its dormancy prior to a hard freeze. Uh, let's see, we are going to go back to the phones now and talk to Roy. Hello, Roy. Hi, Skip. Um, I, I want to continue, I guess, the discussion on the oaks with you. Yes. I have a uh, post oak uh, in my front yard, and I was mowing the grass the other day, and I realized that there were some roots sticking out of the ground, just like a little like a little hump of a root sticking out. And I kind of followed that root down and saw another one sticking out closer to my neighbor's house. The tree seems to be leaning a little bit to the right, um, but it's still making leaves. Um, it, it, it's huge now. So I just didn't know what your suggestion was. Is, you know, is this tree eventually going to going to fall over? Do we need to do something about it? Okay. Just want to get your take so on it. so the the trunk diameter of the tree about waist high, what would you say that is? Is it uh, yeah, how compare it to something. The steering wheel on your uh, car, yeah. a, a Coke can, uh, you know, what how big is that trunk? Yeah. It's probably I would say like a like one of those gallon buckets that you get from Lowe's or Home Depot. Okay, so it's big, very big. Yeah, you're not going to do anything to straighten or whatever. It, about what angle would you say it's leaning at from vertical? Um, so is it at yeah, 45 it, degrees off vertical? or? Yeah, I would say, I'm looking at this, I'm going 90, uh, like a yeah, yeah. <laughs> degree angle. Yeah. What? Say it again. I think, yeah, like I would say maybe it's around the 45 degree. If I okay. Had 45, right. 60, yeah. And, and it used to not lean like that? No, right. It, it, you know, it was uh, when we bought the house, uh, gosh, eight years ago. Mm -hmm. Right. It was. It wasn't leaning. Okay. Um, and then, and then, um, you know, a couple of years ago, I noticed it started leaning, and the leaves started kind of touching close to the roof of our house. Ah, and so, okay. so, um, so is it a? Is it a? Did you say live oak? I missed that. If you did, it's a, yeah, it's a post oak. I think a post oak. Okay. Well, uh, for a tree that size to set to lean at after reaching that age, it should have had a root system that prevented that. So I don't know what's going okay. on. Could have been a really good storm when the soil was so soggy, sopping wet, and it, it that helped it in the lean going in that direction. 
Uh, first thing I do, my first choice would be to call a, a certified arborist to come out and uh, have a look at it and see okay. what do you see, what do they think. Uh, trees like that, they don't straighten back up. And the more it leans, the more it is being pushed to lean more. You know, you know what I'm right. saying. As, right. the, sure, as they sure. get out there, the center of balance gets further and further out. And if, if it had, uh, let's just say, the, the weakness of root support, that got it to the 45 degrees, then, yeah, I would I would have somebody look at that, especially if it's leaning toward your house. There are things that are occasionally done, typically with big live oak limbs, where they're out horizontal and they're sagging too much. They'll put a little pipe mm -hmm. underneath them, cement it into okay. the ground, and have it almost like you know someone's hand is holding the the limb sure, up there, sure, but it's a sure. metal pipe. Uh, but an arbor, a certified arborist can assess that uh, a lot better than me, kind of trying to sure. imagine okay. it on the on the radio. Uh, but I think that would be worth it. You can go to treesaregood.org, trees, okay. A-R-E, good.org. Uh, and as you click through there, you can find out how to find local arborists in the area. Just know that most of our local, in fact, not all of our local arborists are staying very, very busy. Some have quit taking new callers, uh, and uh, <laughs> others still take new callers, but uh, it's it just, they're, they're just, you know, booked up and, and, uh, sure. so I, I would, you're gonna have to call around a little bit and see, and that list may include an arborist or two that works like, let's say for a city parks department or something, you know, sure. that they're not sure. out there for hire necessarily. So I, I would just, uh, I would go there and don't delay much longer. Uh, I think it, okay. it would be good to act on that. Sure. And I'll send you, I'll send you an email with a, with a picture too, uh, when I get home and then, and just have that for you as well. Okay. Well, I'll be back in the studio again next Thursday, and I'll be able to take a look at it uh, at that point. Perfect. Uh, and so right. good luck with it. Thanks, Good. Appreciate your help. You bet. You take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Let's see. We had an uh, email come in from Kenton. Kenton planted a Pawnee pecan. That is a, that's a decent little pecan. I like that. I like Pawnee. It's early, but one of the earliest pecans uh, to to produce its crop in the fall. Uh, but anyway, this Pawnee pecan apparently has died back because you see sprouts coming out of the base below the graft or the bud union, in this case, below that bud union. And uh, so how do you tell if the, the Pawnee part is still alive? Because when a plant is grafted, you've got the root system, and that's genetically one type you know, that, um, what, what should I say, one variety or whatever, a pecan. And then you got the graft, which is the one that makes the quality fruit or not that you want, and it's grafted together. So when the, it dies at the graft union and above, everything sprouting out at the base is not the pecan you want. And you're left with two options. You're left with either pulling it up and putting a new one in, which in many cases is the best thing to do, or finding somebody or learning yourself and trying to bud those rootstock sprouts, bud one of them, and have that take off and become the new tree. On a pecan, that is a, that's not an easy thing to do. And uh, I'm not saying you can't do it. People do it all the time. But uh, I would be inclined to replace it. I think in the long term, it's just much better for you. Now, there's nothing about Pawnee that, that would have made it die in the summer. In other words, any pecan in that situation uh, if one of them is going to die back, it, it would have been it. Uh, what exactly happened there, I don't know. And I think your Kenton's question is basically, you know, how do I know if it's alive? And so just take your thumbnail and scratch the bark above the graft union, just a couple of inches above the graft union. You may have to use a little knife blade to scratch back. Underneath the outer brown bark, you should see a creamy color, maybe even a little bit of a light greenish creamy color underneath there. That indicates it's alive, in which case... Don't worry about it. Wait around. When you see new sprouts, cut the dead top back to wherever the li first living sprout is or a living sprout near above that union. Um, if you don't see brown, uh, in, in, I mean, if you don't see the creamy color and instead it's like a pecan shell brown or paper sack brown, it's dead. And just scratch all around. And if you can't find anything living down around, just above that graft union, it's, it's probably a goner. And uh, you just need to replace it. I have to be the bearer of bad news on that one. Uh, but that uh, hopefully will will help out a little bit. I uh, got an email from Desiree, uh, or Desiree, excuse me. I need to learn how to pronounce names. 
uh, Desiree, and it is about a um, ash juniper, or excuse me, an eastern red cedar uh, that has turned brown. And you're seeing, you're seeing this around town here and there, and in the countryside too. Uh, you just see this whole tree begin to turn brown and die, or maybe one branch turns brown and dies, and what is going on? What? How do you save it? Well, the fact that they're turning brown is not, not good. Um, that, that, that whole branch that has turned brown is, is gone, and you just have to cut it off where it attaches to a living branch or a living trunk if you have one. If the whole tree is turned brown, it's not going to come back. Uh, cedar, this is true of pine, cedar, arbor vitae, juniper. The, the, they don't have the ability to re-sprout new growth except where there's living needles or scaly-like leaves in the case of, a, of this cedar plant. Uh, so for example, if you, uh, let's just use a pine tree as an example. You got a branch, it goes out there, there's no leaves, no needles on it, and as it gets toward the end, then you start having living needles. If you prune back in those living needles, it can, there are buds at the base of those needles that can sprout and grow new shoots. If you go back behind that, and you're, there's no living needles left where you're pruning, that tree can't sprout. Now, normally, trees could. You can go up to every other tree just about in your yard. You cut off the end of a branch, and it just re-sprouts. But this particular situation of these uh, cedars, pines, juniper, uh, arborvitae kinds of plants, they don't have the ability to do that. And so when a branch turns brown, it's gone, and it's not going to come back. What did it? Well, probably drought. It could be other things that exacerbated it, but a lack of water, uh, at some point, they just couldn't keep going. They didn't make it. It could be uh, diseases of the foliage. Typically, those appear as little brown sections all through the plant uh, instead of, you know, just like the whole plant doesn't just get a needle blight all at once, usually. Uh, but it, it's going to be one or more of that, but I... This year, it's kind of hard not to blame heat and drought on everything, uh, or blame everything on heat and drought, uh, because it was just the elephant in the room, and it was so brutal. And, you know, trees go along, and they look fine, they look fine, they look fine, and suddenly people call the extension office and say, my tree died overnight. You know, well, it wasn't overnight, but it looked good until it hit a point where it could not keep up. And when we have 100 degrees and it is blazing down and there's no water in the soil and there hadn't been for a long time because it hadn't rained, there hits a point where it just collapses. It can't, it can't keep going. And uh, water is needed not only to supply photosynthesis and all the biological processes in the plant, the tree in this case, it's also needed to keep it cool. And uh, how hot does something get in the blazing hot Texas sun this summer? You know, all surfaces that the sun shone on get blistering hot. Well, leaves can't get blistering hot. They need to be evaporating water out, transpiring water out into the air to, to, um, to cool themselves that way, too. So it's really a combination of factors. But uh, Desiree, it, uh, I, I, you know, I, I'm looking at the picture, and there is so much dead on that. You're going to have to decide if there's some living still. Number one, it may not stay alive, but it may well at this point in the season if it hadn't already died back. Uh, you're going to have a very marred up, disfigured tree, and, and that may not be worth uh, hanging on to. Let's go back to the phones. The number is 845-5689, and we're going to talk to Elizabeth. Hello, Elizabeth. Hi, Skip. I just um, got back into town, and, and I'm listening to your program, and I thought I would call the Ringer Library to go to the activity tonight about the beneficial bugs. Yes. And unfortunately, they're all filled up. Oh, no. You had, you had to register ahead of time. Well, thanks for reporting that. Uh, that was, yeah, that, okay. Hmm. Mm, yeah, well, that, right. <laughs> that's too bad. That's too bad. Right. And I said, well, what happens if I just come along? And she said, well, they only have seats for 25, but because they are making that, I don't know, bug hotel, yeah. they only bought supplies for 25 people. I got it. Okay. Well, that that was a deal that sounded too good to be true, uh, to have all those yes. free supplies <laughs> to go home with a bug hotel. <laughs> And I said, are you going to be offering that again? Mm -hmm. 
Well, and she didn't know exactly because she said we have all of our yearly activities planned for the entire year. Okay. Well, they do. They stay ahead on those things. And uh, sorry that one didn't work out for you. I, I, you know, you can go online and learn a lot about building those sorts of things too, but it's not like being there. And Kat's a great, great speaker, great person. She, she does such a great job uh, on those. But uh, that would be, I guess, the fallback plan. Right. <laughs> Sounds okay. right. Okay. Right. Need to get our master gardeners to put on a show like that. That would be a, that would be a real popular one. It's good to know that. Well, thanks for right. thanks for letting us know, Elizabeth. I appreciate that. You're welcome. Okay. Bye. 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 That's that's interesting. Um, let's see. We had a email from uh, Becky, and Becky has about a third of her St. Augustine lawn that is inundated with aster. Now, if you're not familiar with aster, I'll tell you how you can find and learn what it looks like. Drive around town, look at someone whose lawn turned completely brown. And if you look at that lawn and there's blue-green weeds in the lawn spreading out all all directions because it was mowed, uh, that is roadside aster, uh, slender aster. One of, there's different names, different kinds of asters, as a matter of fact. But there are weeds in the lawn. And when it comes to fall, like we ought to be getting close to it here, They'll start producing these little daisy-like, maybe dime-sized blooms that are kind of, uh, they're look they're basically white, but they have a pinkish or lavender kind of hue to them. Uh, and boy, oh boy, you got to get those out of there. Uh, so if, if, you, if you try to uh, pull it, you need to make sure the soil is moist when you do that uh, because it pulls so much easier. You may have a one of these aster weeds that's, three feet across. I've seen them about that big. And you, when you grab the base of it, find out where it's coming out of the ground, kind of wiggle it in soft soil, or use a weeding fork to get down underneath there and kind of pry it up. You get it out of there and you get a lot out. At last, I have it in my yard. I have a, one side of my yard with a neighbor, it, always weeds coming in. And I get out there every, every year and pull aster in the yard and fill up five gallon buckets of it. Uh, but I one time counted the seed in one bloom, and there were 50 seeds in that bloom. I know you're thinking, how, what kind of weird person has time to count seed, weed seeds? In a, well, anyway, I did. 50 seeds in that bloom, and there were about 100 blooms on that plant. So do the math. 5,000 seeds. I can bend down on my hands and knees and pull it out, or I can have 5,000 seeds for next year to get to have more fun again. <laughs> so here's the point. Uh, once it's become reproductive, and this is true of weeds in general, once they become reproductive, meaning they're blooming, they're setting seed, those broadleaf weed killers are not going to accomplish much, if anything. And so it's, it's too late. You would have to spray it a little bit earlier, or you would have to put a pre-emergent product to prevent the weed seeds from germinating. And I'd have to go look up uh, on this aster. I would suspect they're probably germinating sometime in March or April. Uh, I could be wrong, but sometime around then. You would have to get a pre-emergent ahead of them to stop them. Now, uh, Becky made the point that, you know, St. Augustine is supposed to choke out its weed problems, you know, kind of what's going on with that. Uh, so it, it can choke out most everything. But it's not going to choke out nutsedge. It's not going to choke out Virginia buttonweed. It's not going to choke out uh, dollarweed, uh, for example. You know what I'm saying? There, there's a lot of weeds that can coexist. Well, there's a few weeds that can coexist in St. Augustine. But as you build your lawn denser and denser over time with proper mowing, watering, and fertilizing, you get it where sunlight can't hit the soil. And little weed seedlings have got to have sunlight. To survive, they just you never they never see the light of day if they can't get the sunlight. I guess that's kind of redundant, isn't it? But that's that's the key, the long term key to it. Uh, but yeah, that is that is a mess. I would pull it up, even Becky, even though it's going to leave bare spots here and there. Those bare spots are not so much that the weed caused them. I see it a lot in weeds where the grass is fully thick in there, uh, not completely dense, but. Uh, there's not really a bare spot, and this weed is just weaving through. Aster will get uh, tall. I, you know, you see it in a vacant lot, and it may be three or four feet tall. I mean, it makes a really big weed, or actually bigger than that. 
Uh, but when you mow, 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 it just goes sideways. And it, it has the growth habit change ability to be able to establish in the lawn. So that is a lot about aster. But that is a bad a weed, and I'm seeing it all over the place in lawns. Is Lawns that can't take the heat and the drought, well, mostly drought, uh, aster can. And it, it does very well in those, uh, those situations. Uh, so that's just something that we have to deal with. Uh, let's see. We had a question uh, that came in, and uh, see if we can find out who this is here. Just one second. Uh, this is from Brittany. Uh, Brittany has some squash plants, and they look nice, uh, but the leaves, the older leaves, are yellow on the plant, and the younger leaves are green. Not as green as we would like to see, uh, but what's going on? What's going on is probably a lack of nitrogen for those plants. Nitrogen is mobile in the plant and so it can take it away from older leaves to support new growth and that that's a sign of a mobile element the old leaves show the deficiency symptom first uh, i would give it a little boost of nitrogen i don't know what kind of soil you have there but if you put in a lot of fresh organic matter uh, maybe you bought a bed mix or something oftentimes there's a lot of nitrogen tie up and we see in that first season of gardening issues with plants trying to grow and I always say give it an extra boost to nitrogen when you have a new mix like that uh, and that should help uh, do it but that's about all you need to do in this case um, so uh, let's see I had a question uh, from uh, Kristen and Kristen has some trees uh, that were planted many years ago been in the house for three summers now and both have new growth at the top but uh, it's there are things growing on the tree and one of the things that I see in the photos is is ball moss that is the little roundish uh, spiky thing that you see growing on the side that is along for the ride it, there's no need to worry about it and just here and there when you get a whole lot of it yeah it can shade out the interior a little bit because it's like a big leaf up there blocking the sun uh, but generally we don't worry about it there are things you can do about it but Generally, it's more a sign that uh, that tree canopy isn't dense and you're getting a little bit of, of uh, light in there. Oh, my gosh, I'm seeing we're running out of time today. There's also pictures of lichen. That, a true, too, is one that points to a problem. The problem is that the tree isn't growing, so now lichens are appearing and doing much, much better in it. The question you're going to have to figure out is why is that tree not growing? What, what's going on there with, with that particular tree? that it's just not doing well. Check for a circling root at the bottom, Kristen, that is strangling the trunk. That's a possibility. Other than that, uh, just, you know, providing the, the watering and fertilizing necessary to try to rejuvenate it would be very helpful. I'm sorry we're running out of time today on that, but uh, hopefully that gets you off uh, to a good start. Uh, I got some other questions. We will jump on those next week. Just reminding you that I'm here on Thursdays from one or 12 to one. And uh, that's the time when I can answer these email questions. You've been questions. listening to Garden Success with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist Skip Richter. Join us again next week as Skip discusses your questions about gardening and landscaping in the Brazos Valley.